In this short video, let's take a first look at the expected shortfall. It's a risk measure. In this introduction to expected shortfall, I am assuming that you are already familiar with what value at risk is. But nonetheless, let's quickly recap it. So if you are given a distribution of losses, which means that the loss that you will incur on the positions that you are holding at the current moment is unknown to you. It's a random variable. And for that random variable, let's assume that there is a distribution which is given to you. From that distribution, and if you understand what value at risk is, you can mark off what we call a quantile which is let's say a number on the x-axis to the left of which is a predetermined area. That predetermined area is the level of confidence at which you are estimating the VAR. So if you mark off that point, let's call it QC or it's the C quantile, then to the left of that you have an area of C, level of confidence, and to the right of that you have an area alpha which is level of significance. That number QC, we refer to that number as the value at risk or VAR estimated at a confidence C. So if you take a look at what this number QC means, mathematically speaking, then it just means that the probability that your loss will be less than the QC is C. Okay. Verbally speaking, it means that you are C confident or let's say if you were to convert C to a percent, you are that much percent confident that your losses will not exceed that VAR number which is given by QC. Alternatively, you can make another statement and that is that the chance or probability that the losses indeed will exceed the QC which is your VAR is equal to the level of significance. So if you were to define a risk measure the way we've just done, this risk measure will answer, let's say, a question from the senior management, which can be phrased like this. At my chosen confidence, let's pick a number, for example, 95% or 99%, how bad can things get as far as my positions are concerned? A very, very attractive feature of this number that we have arrived at, QC, is that if you have positions which are exposed to a multitude of or a number of risk factors, that number which we've just arrived at is like one number which you can keep in mind. That's like the sum all of all these risk factors taken together. It's like telling you that on an aggregate basis, how bad can things get? at a chosen confidence. That means it's not really the worst loss, it's a loss which is at a, my chosen level of confidence. That's as far as VAR is concerned. Now, the attractions which VAR offers to you, those attractions notwithstanding, there are also drawbacks of this risk measure called the VAR. The first one, as I have just said, is that this measure that we've arrived at is based on frequencies, it's based on probabilities. That's what we used to pick this number. We wanted a C area to the left and an alpha area to the right. So in that sense, we didn't directly use make use of the magnitude of these losses. We actually made use of more like frequency or probabilities, okay? So the, the VAR number that we have, it's by no means the worst or the maximum loss, number one. This loss, the VAR number will be exceeded because had it been the worst or the maximum loss, we know that you, you can't get higher than that, right? But if you pick a VAR at a certain level of confidence, this number will be exceeded and you are fixing the chance of that happening as the level of significance, number one. Number two, what if you were to use this VAR to set a risk limit, right? VAR as a risk measure in setting limits. If that were to be the case, then let's say I have two traders, trader A and trader B, who I say have the same risk limits, for example. I impose the same risk limits on both of them. That means the VAR that they are not allowed to exceed as far as you know, their riskiness of their positions is concerned is the same. 
So if that happens, and let's say both these traders design positions such that the VAR of their positions is less than or equal to, let's say on the fringe they are equal to, their VARs are equal to their targeted or maximum VARs, that was the limits we, that was the limits that we had set, then I can by no means rest easy that these two traders have indeed taken the same amount of risk, even though they have the same VAR. Take a look at these two example loss distributions. Both these distributions, you know, it might not look as per my drawing here, but since they have the same VAR, I am assuming that you know both these positions they have the same area to the left and to the right. Okay, and this number at which this happens, in which you know this area is alpha, this area is alpha this area is C, this area is C, is the same for both distributions. That's what I'm saying, okay? So, although they have the same VAR, if I had the means of actually looking into the tail of the distribution, I would have got this intuitive idea that trader B is actually taking unacceptable levels of risks. There are large losses sitting in the tail of trader B's loss distribution, which have a high probability of happening. I mean high relative to the losses sitting in the tail of trader A. This can happen, for example, if trader B is taking positions like writing out of the money puts and he's therefore collecting premiums with this small tiny chance that the market will plunge and all these puts will land up in the money and the bank will have to pay that payoff to the buyer of those puts. The trader B might have been, for example, buying very, very default risky bonds. So there is a high chance that the bonds will deliver, they will pay the promised payoff and there is a small chance that the bonds will not pay you anything. So those are losses which sit completely in the tail and the VAR will not be able to detect those losses because the VAR is plainly just a number which is cutting off the distribution into a body and a tail. It's not like taking a look at what lies in the tail. Okay. So this was my drawback. Now, based on these drawbacks, what if the senior management comes and asks this question? If things do get bad, how bad can they get? Try and compare this question with the previous question that the senior management was asking and the VAR was trying to explain. And that was, give me some kind of a quantitative number which comes back and tells me how bad can things get, okay? And now we are saying, in a rephrased question, if things do get bad, right, and my losses do exceed the VAR, how bad can my losses get, okay? So how much out of place will I find myself? So to answer this new phrased, newly phrased question, we introduce this new risk measure, which we call the expected shortfall. It's also called as the conditional VAR, and it's also called as, let's say, the expected tail losses. Irrespective of what you call it, the expected shortfall, think of it to be a risk measure, which is trying to peek into or look into the tail and try and find out how the losses will behave if they do exceed the VAR, okay? Now, in terms of mathematically defining the ES, we define it as the expected value of the loss given the loss exceeds the VAR. This directly answers this question. If things do go bad, that means if losses do exceed VAR, then conditional on that happening, what is the average or expected loss I am set to incur? So based on the expectation operator sitting here, think of this to be a probability weighted average. Now two things come out of this definition. The first one is that since it's like an average probability weighted of losses which exceed the VAR, so ES as a measure comes out to be greater than VAR. So in that sense, it's a bit more conservative than VAR, number one. Number two is, if ES was the risk measure which was being used, let's say, to provide or impose risk limits on trader A and trader B, then based on the positions that they have put for themselves, 
the ES would have detected that the trader B is taking riskier positions as compared to trader A. Because if I were to take the average probability weighted of losses sitting in the tail, then the, the ES of trader B would have come out to be higher. Okay. So in that sense, we would not have you know, been stuck with the problem which we had with the VAR. Now let's close this video. Now we have an intuitive understanding of what ES is. This is the formula which you should remember. This is the verbal intuitive definition that you should remember. And now let's close this video with a quick look at various formulas which we can use for the ES. And these formulas again highlight what the ES is. If my losses are continuously distributed, which means that my loss, I'm representing it with a random variable L, one particular realization of it, I use a lowercase letter for it. And then I am saying that it's continuously distributed. So I am also given, let's say, the PDF of losses, the probability density function. So this definition of the VAR, if you are well aware of how conditional expectations work because this is not a simple expectation this is a conditional expectation then this formula actually boils down to this formula it's the expected shortfall is equal to one upon alpha alpha is level of significance it's actually the probability of losses exceeding the var that times some kind of a moment or, a, or an average that you have taken from the var up until infinity because here I am assuming I'm working with the loss distribution and this loss distribution it starts from the var and goes all the way till infinity that means I'm covering the tail so it will be like an average probability weighted average so of losses so I take a loss I probability weighted right and I go over all possible losses so because these losses are meant to be only in the tail, they start from the var and move all the way till infinity. Had you been working with gains distribution, that means we were working with the left tail, then you would have done something like this. You would have taken the left tail. It starts off with a gain, which is minus of var. Remember var is a loss. So if you were to mark this number, it's the neg negative of var. So I start from this and I move, let's say here, or actually in terms of you know, proper integration, actually, I should say I start with the extreme left, and I move to the right and stop at the minus var. Okay, so it will be one by alpha integral from minus infinity to minus var of a gain that times its probability that the gain lies in the vicinity of this g. In the end, you also need to negate it. But yes, like the var is a loss and hence you need to negate it because you've just computed it using gains and not losses. Had your losses been discrete losses, then ES would have amounted to one by alpha. Instead of using this integral, I would have just done a probability weighted average. That means take the loss, which lies in the tail. That means it's greater than var and probability weighted with the probability that this loss is realized, the probability mass function in this case. And in the case of gains, it will be negated, it will be one by alpha, take only those gains which are to the left of minus var, that means in the left tail, and then probability weight them, okay? So looking at these four formulas, I think it drives home this intuition about the ES in a much more stronger way. All these four formulas, basically what they are doing is depending on whether my losses and gains are continuously distributed or discrete, they are just calculations which basically compute the conditional expectation okay so this short video i hope would have clarified this concept of expected shortfall assuming that you are already familiar with what the value at risk risk measure is